Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. My name is Amy Draves, and I'm pleased to welcome Ron Lieber to the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. He's here to discuss his book, The Opposite of Spoiled, Raising Kids Who Are Grounded, Generous, and Smart About Money. It's a practical guidebook and a values-based philosophy, which includes a detailed blueprint for the best ways to handle financial basics like allowance, chores, cell phones, and more. Ron is an award-winning columnist at the New York Times, where he writes the Your Money column. He previously has written for The Wall Street Journal, Fortune, and Fast Company mag magazines. He is the author or co-author of three additional books, including Taking Time Off. Please join me and give him a very warm welcome. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Um, this represents a sort of homecoming for me a little bit. So my, my wife uh, used to work at Slate. It was her first job in journalism back when Microsoft owned Slate. And she was an MDASH for a while, and then she graduated, uh, you know, got her badge. What was the color badge back then that was the I, I can go in any door badge? Blue, right. She was a blue badge. Um, for a while and then, you know, moved on to other things in journalism. But, you know, we used to come out here uh, all the time. There was a, um, you know, sort of a deal there uh, at, at, at Slate that, you know, spouses were always welcome to come hang out. So sometimes I would come here and do my work, too, uh, when I needed to be out on the West Coast. And the thing that I had forgotten until uh, I got out of the car here was how much better it smells on this side of the lake. What is, is it just trees? Is that it? It's the tree smell? Oh my God, Brooklyn does not smell like that. It is awesome. It is awesome. Anyway, thank you for having me. Uh, it's such a, a thrill to me that people are interested in this topic. Um, you know, this is really, a, for me, a, a manifesto. It's a cause um, that we are going to be better uh, at this than our parents were uh, generationally. Uh, and so much has changed to make it so much more important, getting this money thing right with our kids, with our grandkids with our nieces and nephews and with our students. And so that is why I'm here. And so um, please do me the favor of keeping your laptops open, of keeping your cell phones out. Um, uh, if you do, um, you know, that's where you can tweet uh, anything outrageous or ridiculous that I say. Um, come hang out. We've got a community thousand strong now kicking around a lot of these money and parenting issues. Um, and that's where you find me if you want to sign up for my newsletter. There's literally a 15 second sign up there. Feel free to do it now when I'm talking. Your boss may be texting you. That's totally cool. Keep your phones out. Um, and thanks. Um, that's me, <laughs> age 10 with more hair. Um, I, I can still get that big if I, if I wait long enough for a haircut. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit the, the story of how uh, I got to this topic and why I care so much about it. Uh, and it really began um, with my navigation of the financial aid system as an undergrad. Um, you know, I learned a lot about, um, about money from having less money all of a sudden when my family uh, went through a divorce first and then there was a job loss. And, you know, our, our household income didn't really return to where it had been for a good long while. And so my brother and sister and I were on financial aid at the school that we went to in Chicago. And, and then I went to college, to Amherst College in Amherst, Massachusetts. Are there any Lord Jeffs in the house, for chance? No, nobody here today. All right, so um, this is the first one where nobody uh, has come out to root me on. Uh, but, uh, you know, I assume they're all busy. They work here. Um, so uh, so I, I went there, and there were, um, you know, a couple of points of, you know, sort of consciousness raising and, and switch flipping for me. The first one was when my mother came out, and she came out, uh, every year, um, including during orientation, the very first moment I was there, and we would sit down with a director of financial aid who, believe it or not, was an ordained minister, Joe Paul Case, or as we refer to him in our house, St. Joe, um, who every year sort of took us in and we basically haggled. We said, Joe, you know, I understand that this is what you think that uh, you can do or this is what you think we ought to get. Um, but here's how the numbers look to us. This is what I'm capable of earning. This is what, you know, we think my mother will get off of her sales commissions. 
this is you know what my father can do we think um, and can you do a little better and every year he always did um, Joe and I are still in touch uh, I was at the National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators Conference uh, just last year where he now has emeritus status he just retired after 40 years in the business uh, and we took a picture together uh, you know I, and I had a button on that said I love my financial aid administrator <laughs> they were passing those out all over the conference so anyway yeah st. Joe was very good to me but the other thing that happened at school um, was that uh, there was a moment uh, in the very first weekend when they sent all of the financial aid kids down the hill to a meeting by themselves and all the kids who weren't on financial aid stayed at the top of the hill in the dorms to hang out and get to know one another and I don't think they meant this to be any big deal but I remember anticipating it knowing that it was going to happen and trying to guess by looking at everyone at the room which one of the kids were going to be walking down the hill with me and which ones were going to stay at the top and I never forgot that moment and so you know one of the things that uh, I learned from my experiences uh, with St. Joe was that, you know, almost every system can be beaten in a completely legal way that does not involve sticking your toe over the line, right? Um, complex systems, uh, you know, they have loopholes, they have rules that people don't understand, and there are perfectly legitimate ways to uh, exploit them. Maybe that's too strong of a word, but at least take advantage of the system as it's set up. And so uh, I grew up to be the person in journalism whose beat is beating the system. I didn't figure this out for myself at all. It wasn't until 10 years into my career when I went to work for the Wall Street Journal that they kind of figured it out for me, that I was the guy who wrote the story that explained that there were five mattress retailers in the United States where you could call them pay them some money, have them ship you or deliver you the mattress, and you could try it out for free and then give it back and get a full refund. And so not only did I figure out that that was possible, but I actually did it over the course of three months. We had a bunch of mattresses in and out just to prove to readers that like this really important purchase, you know, you spend a third of your life on it if you're lucky, if you get that much sleep, you know, you ought to be able to try it out. You know, you don't just go to the showroom and lay down on it for a minute. So things like that uh, and they said you know Ron that's personal finance we've just never defined it in that way before and this is this is what you were born to do and it became my life's work because I had good editors who saw something in me that I had never seen uh, in myself uh, but then I became a parent and um, I lost all uh, confidence right there's nothing like a little person who is relying on you uh, to really shake you up and within a couple of years, uh, even though I, by then I was playing this money expert in the newspaper at the New York Times in front of a million people or so uh, every weekend, um, you know, her questions to me and my wife um, stopped me cold. I didn't know how to answer her. I wasn't sure what to say. And the reason was, I finally figured out, was that it was clear to me that um, these questions that she had about money in particular, starting fast and furious at the age of three or four, were actually questions about values. At their root, they were about why did we make the choices that we did? Why did we live in this size house instead of that size house, or this neighborhood instead of that neighborhood? Why were we journalists and not software developers so that we could make a little bit more money? Um, you know, I mean, they were asking, she asked these questions early on, you know, questions that kind of cut to our core. And they were all the more complex because she was too young to really understand the sophisticated version of the answers. So I started putting these questions up online on a blog uh, at the Times, and a bunch of people saw them and right around the time that Occupy Wall Street happened they asked me to come speak to their communities where people with more and people with less uh, were feeling very uncomfortable about the conversations that were going on around the dinner table and they didn't know what to say to their kids about it and I tried to think about how I could help those people and I thought well if there's one thing that everybody has in common is that nobody wants to raise a spoiled child because spoiled is something that you do to them they are not born that way. Spoiled kids are made, and they're usually made by their parents. So I thought, okay, well, if we can agree on that, and I think we can, then what's the opposite of spoiled? You know, what's the solution here, right? And the dictionary wasn't helpful, or the, the thesaurus wasn't either, right? Because the opposite of spoiled is fresh, which you can apply to fro produce or meat, but it doesn't really work in this context. So, you know, I, I made this list of um, all of the values and virtues and character traits that added up to the opposite of spoiled. Modesty and patience and generosity and grit 
and thrift and curiosity and prudence and perspective. And I looked at that list and I thought, whoa, you can use money to teach every single one of these values, right? You know, we give and we're careful about our spending and it's okay to ask questions. In fact, we value that because being curious about money is, you know, the beginning of mastering it. Having perspective on how much you have and who has more and who has less and how that came to pass and whether it's fair and not bragging or showing off the things that we have or that we do and being willing to wait, uh, delayed gratification and all of that. And so I realized that money was actually a great teaching tool for these things. And I went and spoke to the parents about it and they were the ones that encouraged me to write this book. Um, so once again, you know, somebody else seeing something that I had not realized in my work that was adding up to something more. So I did what I was told. Uh, I took a leave. Uh, and, I, and I wrote this book, and that's kind of how I got to where we are today. So um, this is actually supposed to be my daughter. Uh, one of the illustrators at the Times put this together uh, when I wrote the original column about the questions that kids ask. And you can see there's like a shadow sort of looming over her. She's kind of looking up, you know, she's got a million questions. They're all kind of exploding out of her head. Uh, and it is our job to answer them, right? Their job is to be curious, to figure out how the world works. Money is a source of great mystery and wonder, and so they ask. And so there are a number of ways for us to answer, right? Um, so I would ask you to think about a couple things. Um, first of all, one of the best answers to almost any money question, and it works pretty well for other hard questions too, is why do you ask? And it's not why do you ask, as if they're doing something wrong by asking or that it's impolite or inconvenient. Uh, we want to honor their curiosity, I think, and encourage them to keep asking. But often the questions don't actually have um, anything or very much to do with what they're saying. So very often kids who are young will ask if we're rich or if we're poor. Or they'll ask how much money we make, even though you know, they're not mathable enough at that point to really comprehend the answer, because they're not up to you know, five and six figure numbers in math class. Uh, so you really want to try and figure out what's at the root of it. And if you ask them that question, why do you ask? You know, often the answer is, well, you know, someone on the playground said that their mother made a million dollars, right? Or I heard you and dad fighting. Uh, about money and I'm worried that we're running out of money, right? Or once they start reading, they see something in the newspaper about people who are unemployed and maybe you're unemployed and they think that they're about to be poor. Or you just got a new car and they think they're rich. And so you want to try and divert the conversation if you can, you know, to the things that they're actually asking about and not answer anything more because they may not actually be curious about what they originally said that they were going to. Plus, why do you ask is a great stalling tactic. Um, it would have worked particularly well for my friend Christy, uh, who a couple of years ago uh, was confronted by, uh, you know, her son who marched into the room one day at the age of six and pulled himself up and said to Christy and her conservative father from the South, when are we going to start having some more sex around here? <laughs> so Christy didn't know what to do. Christy and I had not had the why do you ask conversation yet. So Christy, in front of her father, had to deliver a sort of abbreviated version of the birds and the bees and explain to you know, Gus that he wasn't really ready for sex yet and it was a grown-up thing and, oh, by the way, that's like how you make babies and Gus looks very confused. But, you know, Gus did not want to have sex. He did not want to have sex with his mother, with his grandfather. That wasn't what he was after. He had been watching Family Guy. I don't know why they let him do that. But it occurred to him after several episodes of Family Guy that the word sex was a great way to make the laugh track go crazy. And so there he was. When are we going to start having some more sex around here? Um, something else to keep in mind. You know, I'm glad that the person in that picture is a girl. Um, there's a lot of research out there that shows that girls um, do not ask as much about money as boys do, that parents don't talk to them as much about money uh, as they do to boys. When they do talk to girls, they talk to them about charity. Uh, and as a result, uh, girls, when they're polled as teenagers, uh, have salary expectations that are 20 to 30 percent lower than boys do. Uh, as a father of a nine-year-old girl, this really pisses me off. 
And if there's anything that I intend to accomplish here, it's to make sure that parents don't see, you know, silence from their girls as a lack of curiosity or a lack of need to learn about money. It just may be that something in the culture has told them that they shouldn't be asking or that it's not something for them. And of course, that's not true, uh, but we have to tack against it. So these are the three jars from the front of my book. Um, and I put them there for a reason. Uh, they're there in part because this is the sort of basic foundation of what it means to create an adult budget. You know, if we're doing it right and, you know, we're reasonably generous people, you know, we're spending 80% of what we make on mortgages and cars and school and whatever else. You know, we're saving 10 or 15% so that we can retire someday and then we're giving away the rest. Or, you know, if you're, if you're a Mormon um, or some other uh, faith where you automatically give 10% no matter much, no matter what, maybe you're giving a little more. But that's a basic adult budget. Um, but the other thing that I like about this is that you know, these words and these jars are stand-ins for some of the values that we want to imprint, right? Spending, well, what we're really trying to teach is prudence and thrift, um, but not, um, you know, self-denial. I mean, what we want our kids to be able to do is, is have the kind of wherewithal to understand what kind of spending makes them most happy, delivers the highest return, and then it's spend a lot of extra money on that, and nothing on the stuff that really doesn't, you know, give us the same kind of buzz. Um, saving, you know, it's patience, it's delayed gratification, uh, and giving is uh, all about generosity. Um, so, you know, it's a stand-in for our values, too. Um, and it's the basic foundation for allowance. And so, um, uh, something else that allowance is about, now, why are you laughing? <laughs> Wait, who laughed first? And tell me why this is funny, because uh, let's, let's get at the root of this. You're smiling. What, what, what made this? Because I know how much Hunter Wellies cost. All right, is anybody wearing Hunter boots? <laughs> not today. OK, yeah, this, is, this has been an issue for me. Um, I, you know, there's nothing wrong um, with adults wearing Hunter boots. Um, and there isn't even really, well, anyway. <laughs> The biggest challenge that adults have in figuring out their spending, and certainly the biggest challenge we have with teaching kids, is understanding the difference between wants and needs. And for every category of spending, adult spending and kids spending, there's a range of items on the list, right? So if we're thinking about wellies, and you know, I love doing this here because it rains a lot, right? So people totally get the rain boot thing. Every kid needs them, right? You can get you know, um, generic rain boots from, um, where, where would you get your generic rain boots here? Like Payless or something, right? Yeah, so it's yeah, or Target or Walmart, right? So maybe those cost 20 bucks. And over here, we have the hunter boots. And the hunter boots uh, for kids probably cost 70, 80, 90 bucks. And for grown-ups, they're, they're into the low three digits. Uh, and so as parents, uh, you know, what I try and encourage people to do is to say for every category to their kids, look, this is what we are willing to pay for. You know, in, in the athletic shoe category, in the underwear category, in the winter coat category, in the bicycle, electric guitar, uh, you know, a softball glove, every one, you know, you need to be able to say to kids, look, this is, this is where we are and this is what we'll pay for. And so in clothing, look, I'm from the Midwest, like out here it would be, um, it would be REI, maybe you would make the REI uh, line, right? But, but for, you know, every category of spending, you say, this is what we'll do. And in our household, uh, my feeling is that we always try and draw the land's end line, which says to our daughter, right, okay, in whatever category we're in, we will pay for whatever the land's end equivalent price is. So for, you know, the wellies, it would probably be 40, 50 bucks for the land's end ones. And if you want the hunter boots, you're going to have to pay for the difference between here and here, out of your own money, your birthday money, your Christmas money, your Hanukkah money, out of your allowance, whatever. So again, different families may have different lines. You know, your, your line may be a target line or it may be a north face line, so it might be to the left or the right of mine. But if you can lay it out this way for kids, you know, they don't have to like it, right? They don't have to like where you put the line and it's not up for negotiation, uh, but it does give them a sense of, you know, how you make these decisions. And so one of the uh, trickiest questions that anybody ever asked me uh, when I was giving one of these talks is, you know, mother got up and said, 
So my son came to me recently and said he didn't understand why he could not have a carnivorous plant terrarium, given that they had bought hunter boots for his sister to wear. And I thought that was awesome. Um, <laughs> because he saw something, uh, I think, that his mother hadn't quite been able to articulate, uh, which was that um, you know, his ask was for a tool for learning, right? Carnivorous plant terrarium, you got botany, you got animal behavior, you've got you know, science, you know, it's all, all sorts of good stuff. Hunter boots are a luxury product. They are a want and not a need. Whereas tools for learning, I think in most families that um, you know, have some disposable income. Tools for learning are sort of mandatory. We spend as much on them as we possibly can. So I said, you should get the kid the carnivorous plant terrarium, but make him pay for his own flies. Um, so, you know, this is all well and good, and I puffed myself up. Um, a couple months ago, uh, my daughter came home <laughs> wearing those. And I thought, OK, um, this is not something uh, I would have ever chosen to pay for. I think my wife knows uh, that I've been you know, riffing in this manuscript on hunter boots. What on earth happened here? It turns out that grandma got involved. <laughs> Grandparents are a menace in this regard. They think it's their job to spoil kids, that they were put on the earth specifically to subvert all of our rules and values. And decisions, they do it with great glee. <laughs> and um, so a couple of years earlier, a leather miniskirt had showed up in the mail from a different grandma. <laughs> that went back to the store. I sucked it up um, and let this one go. And I'm glad I did, because now my daughter is like totally tuned into this, right? She thinks the whole thing is very funny. So we're walking down the street. Just a couple uh, weeks ago, we were in um, Fulton Street in downtown Brooklyn, where there is a ton of um, sort of cut rate discount stores. She grabs my hand. She said, Dad, Dad, there's generic hunter boots in the window. <laughs> and sure enough, there they were for the same $20 they would have cost at Payless. And, so we took a little uh, glamour shot and, uh, and let it go. So uh, people often ask me about, um, about chores and whether kids should have to um, do chores in order to get allowance. Um, I think the answer is uh, no. I think money, again, is a tool for learning. It's for kids to practice. Um, it falls in the same category as a uh, paintbrush or an electric guitar. Uh, or a book, we would not take these things away if the kids weren't doing their chores. So I don't think we should take the money away either. Uh, but as far as the chores are concerned, they should do a ton of them. They can do more than we think they are capable of. Uh, are any of you guys watching MasterChef Junior right now? Uh, do you know, it's, a, it's a reality show with a bunch of like 8 to 12 year olds cooking insane feasts and competing against one another. It is now clear to me that 10 year olds absolutely can and should be cooking dinner. Um, <laughs> And they should do it for free, the same way we do all, a lot of stuff for them for free. And if we don't like the way they're doing those chores, we can take away privileges. We can take away screen time. We can take away car keys. We can do all sorts of things to keep them in line. Um, but again, chores, there should be a ton of them. And you can really geek out on this stuff. So I spent some time with um, Mormon families uh, in Utah while I was doing the reporting for this book just to see what life is like in families with a whole mess of kids. And um, so this is you know, one of the chore charts from uh, one of the Mormon families I visited. They're the Palmer family, and you know, they got points for the completion of various chores. Those are the Palmer points. Um, they also uh, you know, got extra bonuses for being uh, for being uh, anxiously engaged, which to them means like you know doing it with um, a, a lot of expediency and care and and focused, um, and then you know you've got all of their um, you've got all of their uh, you know the regular duties that they need to do as well, and it gets highly specific, right? So I I don't actually know what an entry bench is, um, but they have one uh, and they need to be dusted. Uh, you know, the bedroom needs to be good and clean, not just clean and not just good, but good and clean. Uh, the door between the mudroom and kitchen must be washed. This was, a, this was a household that actually had a water fountain installed right next to the mudroom. Uh, just gives you a sense of like the level of traffic and uh, excitement in that house. They just decided to put water in. Uh, so, you know, you can, go, you can go really deep on the chores, but I don't know that I would pay for them exactly. So. Um, we were looking at the share, char, the share jar before. I think uh, all of us want to raise generous kids. And people ask me a lot, well, what are kids really capable of at the age of four or five or six? Um, are they born generous? And the answer is yes, right? Science shows us that. And we know it just from you know, the toddlers who are constantly trying to hand us their grimy Cheerios. 
right? They like sharing. They like reaction that it, that it fosters. Um, and they're primed, um, you know, for charity and for giving at, at a very early age. Um, this comes from a, a, a girl whose family I know in Brooklyn. And she uh, had questions about the protesters during Occupy Wall Street. She wanted to know what was going on. And her parents said to her, um, well, you know, there are some people who have more and there are some people who have less. And there's a lot of people who think that's not fair. And we're trying to figure out what to do about it, which was a pretty good explanation of what the protests were all about. And so she went home and she drew a sharing machine. And so at the top, you know, goes in the gold pieces and they come down the pink funnel and it turns into, you know, red and blue money. And then out it goes off the phallic elephant tusk, you know, out into the world where the money is, I guess, redistributed. Now, you know, not every kid is, is a fan of redistribution. Um, it turns out some of them go to school and uh, write stories about how people should not have to pay higher taxes. Uh, so this showed up at my daughter's school, and of course, being a busybody reporter, I called the family. I said, did you, did you know about this? I said, I think it's so cool that he has these opinions. Where does it come from? And they were horrified. <laughs> and then they stopped, and they looked through the book collection, and they realized that like two months earlier, they had been reading a book about the Boston Tea Party. And so he remembered that there had been this protest a couple hundred years ago that people didn't want to pay higher taxes to the British. And that was how it started. And so it's not clear you know, what sort of um, politics this boy is going to have when he grows up. But you know, clearly, he's absorbing this whole question about you know, equity and redistribution. And we can absolutely bring kids in our, in our own discussions as well. Um, Last year, we sat down with our daughter, and we put a bunch of beans on the table, 100 beans, and then we divided them into piles according to how we allocated our charity giving. And so, you know, river blindness, devastating disease for, you know, something like 75 or 100 bucks, you know, you can, you can actually save a life because the treatments are so, um, um, you know, effective, and, and there, um, there are organizations now that do a really great job of making sure that people are uh, inoculated and get treated. And, you know, there's the, you know, basically what I consider to be payback uh, for financial aid. Uh, there's a couple of those. Um, and, uh, you know, breast cancer. My mom's a, sur a survivor of premenopausal breast cancer, so we give there. Um, you know, food for the hungry, homeless children, public radio. Uh, my um, uh, grandmother by marriage is a Holocaust survivor. Uh, you know, so we try and help um, older Jewish people. And then, um, and then there was the one. You can see that this one's in a different handwriting. So we said to our daughter, what's missing here, and do we need to move the beans around to make it more fair and more reflective of the things that are truly important to us and truly important to you? And the thing that I liked about what she did is that she saw this, which is payback for my financial aid, and this, which is payback for my financial aid, and she decided that she wanted us to give money to the scholarship fund at her camp so that kids who are like the way that I was when I was a kid would be able to go to. That, to me, was victory. Um, a close cousin of generosity is gratitude. Uh, because one of the things we try and talk to our kids about, I think, is you know, we sort of have um, a, almost a duty as human beings to sort of throw the rope back for others. One day it might be us that need help, uh, or maybe we have already been the people who needed help, whether it was, you know, financial aid from a fancy private school or uh, like her great-grandmother, Grandma Hanna, who, uh, you know, was literally taken in and, you know, spirited across Europe and on a boat into New York and taken in by all of the refugee organizations in the 1940s and 50s so that she can make a life and a family and make a wife uh, or help make a wife for me. Um, and so, um, you know, this is part of what, uh, this is part of what we do. Um, you know, we help uh, and, and we are grateful for what we have and for all of the things um, that have been given to us. And so, you know, when you start thinking about gratitude on a more kind of consistent basis, it's really powerful. There's a lot of um, science that's been done on this, uh, particularly out of the Greater Good Science Center at the University of California at Berkeley. Do any of you get their newsletter, the Greater Good Science Center? It's fantastic, totally worth signing up for. Um, you know, thinking about the power of gratitude has, has literally um, made me a happier person. I feel like I'm about 20% happier than I was when I started the research for this book. And it's just through 
some sort of daily gratitude ritual. Sometimes when I'm waiting for the subway, I'll stop and I'll think about someone or something that did something awesome that day. Uh, for me, for the world, something that you know, moved me even in a small way. So it turns out kids like to do this too. It's incredibly powerful for kids to do it. Um, and you can do it through a grace saying ritual if you happen to be people of faith. Um, or you can just sit around the table and hold hands and close your eyes and say gracias, um, which is what a family in Vermont that I visited does. And it's a great way to sort of stop, pause, think about what you have, and simply say one word, thank you. But what kids really love to do, it turns out, is give toasts. Because it makes them feel like grown-ups, and they're raising their glass, and it's raucous, and everybody does cheers. Kids love that stuff, right? So, you know, if nothing else, have a nightly or a Friday nightly or at least a semi-regular toasting session so they can think about the things and the people that did cool stuff that week that made them happy and grateful. Uh, so we haven't talked so much about paid work. And paid work for teenagers has uh, gone out of style a little bit. Um, you know, it started uh, with the labor laws, all of which are great. Um, but, you know, we still have some sort of historical memory of that, and we worry now about kids working too much. But in, you know, upper middle class and above communities, the definition of too much equals their grades will suffer, this after-school job is not as important as being a theater person or an athlete, and they won't get into Stanford. <laughs> and so um, this idea has developed that I believe is actually false, and I've spoken to enough admissions officers now to, to, to know for sure that it's false, um, that, that work is actually kind of devalued, that paid work is devalued, and it's better for them to do all of the usual array of extracurricular activities so their applications look like everybody else's, which is not really the way to stand out when you know, only one in 20 kids get into Stanford. Um, and so just to prove this point, I started this um, you know, annual series of um, college admissions essays where we do a contest in the newspaper uh, where we pick the very best essays that have been written about money and work uh, by 17-year-olds who are applying to college. And these kids are you know, going amazing places, telling incredible stories. And it turns out kids want to work. They're primed to work. Um, there's a whole riff in the book about um, tin can uh, collection and redemption. Kids do it up and down the income spectrum. I have stories of families who do it all the time. Uh, you know, the Clark girls, that's the back of the elder girl's head. Uh, they live in San Jose, California. And they got so into the can and bottle collection, their, their parents drink a lot of beer. Uh, they have a lot of parties, uh, and the girls, you know, dutifully clean it all up. And uh, in exchange for that, you know, once every three months, mom or dad takes them to the scrapyard in San Jose, and off they go. And this place is like the scene out of the that movie in the first Star Wars film, you know, where it's like every race, shape, size of person from all over the place, you know, Boy Scout troops and. You know, you name it, um, people working there and going there. There's like shards of glass flying around. They're crunching stuff. It's really noisy. You can actually borrow earplugs when you're there. It's so loud. And, you know, the girls walk through uh, and know exactly what to do. They know everybody behind the scales. They know the cashier by name. Uh, you know, and they walk out of there with 80 or 90 bucks, and they take it to the credit union and put it away. Uh, kids like working. Um, and I was so uh, interested in this idea of kids and work um, I got it in my head that we might actually all be better off if we were more like farm families, where, you know, in the old days you would actually produce more kids specifically to do the work. And so I went and I tracked down um, some dairy farm families in Utah, again, you know, where they had a lot of kids, many of them were Mormon. Um, and this is um, Zeb, short for Zebediah. Uh, he is the youngest of eight uh, on a dairy farm near the Utah-Idaho uh, border. Um, he was five at the time that I met him. Uh, and it is clear to the Smith boys from the earliest possible age that they will work and that they can do much of what the grown-ups do. Um, so Zeb, at the age of five, he's perched on the tractor, okay? So the tractor is on, it's moving, and Zeb's job is to steer the tractor at one mile an hour as it sort of goes down uh, the aisles of newly born calves, and then the seven-year-old and the five-year-old, or the seven-year-old and the nine-year-old are trailing behind him, and they're grabbing the bottles that the, that the 11 and the 13-year-old have prepared out, and they're dropping them in the slot in the calf pens uh, so that the calves can have their milk. So Zeb does this. Um, you know, every, every five-year-old boy in the Smith family gets his first gun, 
And Zeb's job is to uh, be safe with the gun first and foremost. They know all about gun safety. And Zeb's job is to shoot at the Tweety birds that bother the cows uh, and can potentially spread disease. So that's another job that Zeb has. Um, so, you know, we can't all be farm families. Uh, and not every family uh, lives outside of a place like, you know, Redmond or Bellevue or, you know, on the side of Lake Washington where um, most of what surrounds you are people who are more or less like you. Um, and for that, you know, to get kids away um, from what surrounds them during the year, uh, many parents turn to summer camp, overnight camp in particular. And uh, I wanted to find the sort of most amazing version of um, overnight camp that kind of strips away uh, all of the non-necessities in life. I found it on an island in Maine, in the middle of the state, in the middle of a lake. It's called Pine Island Camp. There are 90 boys there each summer. Uh, no electricity, barely any running water. Um, the only entertainment there is what they do for one another. They make up skits, they make up games. Um, and, you know, each night, uh, the fun that they have is based on the fun that they make and create for themselves. It's such a communal experience, in fact, that, um, you know, the kids are no longer at home where everyone has their own bathroom. They are no longer at home where everyone has a bathroom door, even. And this is where they go. Uh, it's called the Lou with a View. It's up two flights of stairs. It's a you know, beautiful view. You can't see the screened window uh, on the other side. Uh, but this is where they sit and do their business. And, um, and they take great delight in taking visitors in there and making them go to the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you, know, you, you want to talk about like, you sort of getting away from like, the stuff and the amenities that tend to surround kids these days. Uh, overnight camp can be a great way to do it. So, or you can do this, right? Uh, you can go to the kind of store, and this store shall remain nameless, where uh, camp is somehow associated with uh, a luxury product. Um, I still can't get over this one. And I'm actually speaking in a couple weeks in the town where this was spotted. I have no idea what I'm going to say to these people. Um, <laughs> So for the truly affluent, you know, there may be some, um, some folks around here who were in on this whole Microsoft business early. And you may well be, uh, you know, sitting on millions and millions of dollars. Um, and if you are, that's great. You're probably thinking about um, how best to make sure that your kids are not getting the wrong idea about what their adult life is going to be like or how hard they're going to have to work to reproduce whatever it is that you managed to make. Um, and I was talking to a family about this recently, and they said that they had realized that they'd made a mistake by taking their kids on too many fancy vacations too soon because they overheard the kids comparing the poolside amenities that were delivered by the staff at various Four Seasons resorts that they had been to. Um, and they were horrified. These parents both grew up working class. They hustled for everything that they got. And they were now extremely wealthy. But they realized that they had it all wrong. And they needed to um, be doing more uh, what they were referred to as deliberate downgrades, which sounds like a very upper class thing to say. But the fact of the matter is, and you know, the sociological research has kind of pointed this out and named it, for families that have more than average, there's a lot of um, you know, sort of symbolic deprivation that goes on, uh, right? If you can afford much or even all of what your kids want, uh, you certainly don't want to give it all to them. And so you're going to need to draw lines in the sand of like what is OK and what is not. Um, and so you know, being served a poolside drink at a you know, resort with a you know, graduated edge pool um, you know, may or may not be your version of over, being over the line. Uh, but, you know, I, I now think about, uh, you know, this family in the Four Seasons uh, when I go out and talk to people and when I think about, you know, what we splurge on and whether our daughter is getting the wrong idea from that. And, you know, they may be getting the wrong idea if we're not narrating our choices. Um, phones, technology, look, we're at Microsoft. Um, this is a big deal with 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds when they start to get them. My feeling about this is smartphones are a want. They are not a need. Every kid needs a cell phone at a certain point, I think, just because teachers and coaches even are texting them. They text with one another. 
but I'm not sure you need internet access on your phone at the age of 11 or 12 when you probably have a PC at home or a tablet that they can use that has internet access there. And so my feeling is that if they want this, uh, if they want Instagram on their phones uh, or whatever it is that they want while they're on the go or whether they're in school if it's allowed, then they ought to pay for it. They ought to pay for the data plan, they ought to pay for the hardware, you pay for the basics, they pay for the rest. And the same thing goes with cars. Um, you know, this is the boxy Volvo of many of our youths. Uh, to me, it's, it's sort of a symbolic of a sturdy, kind of tank-like used vehicle that you know that you can rely on. Cars have only gotten better over time. Uh, even the 10-year-old ones uh, today, you know, all have airbags. Many of them have stability control. All of the stuff that you'd want kids to have. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm a big believer in, in used cars and making kids pay for them. This they cannot pay for. <laughs> this is the kind of thing that uh, only a parent can pay for. Um, maybe we have some you know, fractional owners or jet owners in the room, I'm not sure. Um, but where kids tend to see this kind of thing most often is on Instagram. Um, inevitably, in you know, relatively well-off communities, or especially well-off communities, uh, there will come a point when uh, a kid that they know or a friend of a friend posts a picture of themselves in some insane place. You know, maybe it's the 50-yard uh, line at the Super Bowl, or maybe it's down uh, on the field with Russell Wilson, or maybe it's, you know, in a private jet they've hitched a ride on, or that, you know, they have access to 25 hours of each year. And, you know, I've heard from a lot of parents who have said that um, I actually wanted to break my kid's phone the first time I realized that they were looking at this stuff. And they can follow, do, do any of you know the rich kids of Instagram account? You can actually follow a count with like, uh, a whole bunch of pictures like this. And, you know, kids get all the wrong reasons about, you know, what's possible. And, you know, Instagram in a lot of ways can become a sort of engine of envy, right? Even if there are no private jet photos, it's possible for kids to get the wrong idea about what everybody else's life is like, because all anybody ever posts is they're awesome, right? Like, here are me, you know, I just got these awesome new clothes with my awesome friends on my awesome birthday, and you weren't invited, and my post has more likes than yours does. And it can be very easy as an adult, let alone a child, following that stuff, to think that your life is somehow wanting. And so, it's not to say the kids shouldn't have phones, not to say the kids shouldn't have Instagram, just that we need to watch what they're consuming, in the same way that we watch carefully what they're consuming on television. I mean, this for them, the rich kids of Instagram, this is the new TV. So as you can probably tell by now, you know, I feel really strongly that there's a deep-rooted connection between money and feelings and behavior and emotions. You know, the basic um, science and economics of personal finance are pretty well established now. You know, you spend a little bit less than you make. You know, you put the rest away uh, for safekeeping and for retirement. Invest in index funds or Microsoft stock. Maybe not recently. I can't remember. Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, you know you, you, you know, you save as much as you can. You put it someplace relatively stable. You have a diverse collection of assets. Uh, and uh, you buy some insurance. And, uh, you know, you continue to work diligently. And you, you know, cross your fingers that you don't have a big interruption in income. But the way that we screw things up, is when we let our emotions govern our spending and our investing and even sometimes our giving. Um, and it's especially powerful when it comes to our kids and our money and their money and what we want to do for them. Uh, because it's a, it's a complex emotional stew, right? On one hand, you've got your parenting instincts, uh, you know, which are all emotion. Uh, and you've got your money instincts, which are often majority emotions. And when you try and think about parenting and money and kids, it's just incredibly complicated. And so I always uh, ask people to just think, right? You know, am I making a money decision here? Or am I making a feelings decision here? Uh, because when it comes to our kids, we really want to get that right. Thank you. Uh, so that's where you can find me. Literally 15 seconds, drop in your first name and email address. Uh, I promise I won't bug you too often, but I have other uh, acts of um, uh, long-form journalism I intend to commit in this uh, particular area of parents and money and values and decisions uh, before too long. So um, 
please keep me posted uh, on where to find you, and I will keep you posted on what else I'm learning. Uh, but before we go, I'd love to take questions. Um, ask me anything about the newspaper, about the book, about the rich kids of Instagram. <laughs> How about it? Mm -hmm. So in your um, slide with the Land's End to the Hunter to the Chief, you said uh, the Land's End was your line for what you were willing to spend. And if they mm -hmm. wanted to spend beyond, they could. Mm -hmm. If they were willing to take something on the target end, mm -hmm. would you give them the balance between what you were willing to spend and what they settled for? Uh, not in isolation for a child age 6 to 10. But one thing that I advocate doing, and I think we're going to do this with our daughter starting in the next year or two, is that you can take your collection of you know, Land's End lines or Target lines or REI lines um, and uh, you know, sit down with your child in July or August and say, OK, here are all the things that we think you've grown out of or that you'll need. Um, and we've got a Land's End line uh, for your boots, and we've got a North Face line for your winter coat, and we've got a Target line for your underwear. And so here's the budget. Here's the underwear money for Target. Here's the Land's End line for the boots. Here's the you know, 180 bucks or whatever it is for the North Face jacket. We're going to throw all that money into a pile, and you decide. And if you don't want the North Face jacket, then you can buy the Target jacket. And if you want to you know, buy your bras and underwear at Victoria's Secret, have at it. Um, but you know, we're not going to give you any more money. And if you screw it up, you're going to have to find a way to earn more to get the things that you need. And um, it's up to you. Uh, so you, know, you, can, you can bring them in on that and, and in effect reward them for making good trade-offs uh, at a certain point. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I would give them money back at an early age for picking the cheaper option. Oh, it's an interesting idea. I know parents that um, you know, when they go out um, for dinner, uh, they'll give their kid a dollar for having water. Uh, so that's sort of like a, a similar, similar way to go at it. Although, I, I don't know, I, different parents are different. Um, you know, we generally don't let our daughter order drinks in a restaurant because going to a restaurant is a treat in and of itself. So. Mm -hmm. That was me. That was you. I wrote it. Oh, okay. I didn't do it, but I wrote it. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was an excerpt from The Opposite of Spoiled. Okay, okay. so I thought yeah. that was really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wonder what age is that appropriate? Mm -hmm. um, my kids are five and eight. And right. And yeah, so, um, so the question, yeah, sorry. The question was, um, should you disclose uh, what you make to your kids, and if so, when? Uh, and so uh, this gentleman, Scott Parker, he, he did this with kids ages 17 to seven, I think, um, you know, completely radical. He throws the money on the table and he starts peeling it off into the budget pile so that they could see where it all went and there really wasn't very much left because he had six kids and, you know, even at $10,000 a month, you know, the kids were in Cub Scouts and they had pizza night once a week and, you know, pizza night for eight and, you know, you're down 150 bucks, right? So, um, so anyway, so yeah, he did that for them. I don't think the young ones are ready. My feeling about this is that your kids uh, deserve to know um, it's a great thing to teach them, but not until at least 10 years have gone by of intensive you know, allowance training over here, and then you introduce them to the idea of the household budget so they know what that money might go into. So they're learning about rent and mortgage and insurance and bills, and they're going to the grocery store with you for a year. Um, and then over here, right, you're teaching them about discretion. You're testing them. Am I going to, um, are they going to keep their siblings' secrets, which they often have trouble doing if they have siblings? Are they going to keep their friends' secrets, or are they going to gossip and cause pain to people who are close to them? Are they going to keep the family secrets? And then, um, you know, you pose it as a test to them. Say, this is grown-up information. Um, we believe that you're ready for it. We want you to understand what it takes to have a life like this. And if you want a different life, um, what that, how much more that might take. And, you know, you could ask us questions about that, but you should know uh, that this information is not valuable outside of our household. People aren't really all that interested in it. And so if you talk about it, you are going to sound like an asshole. <laughs> and so, you know, at that point, kids are not going to want to flunk um, the discretion test. They're not going to want to flunk the maturity test. They're definitely not going to want to flunk the asshole test with their friends. And at that point, they keep it to themselves. And it's good information to have. Mm -hmm. Just because you want them to understand that mm -hmm. you know, this is a privilege. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, well, how much does it cost? Or, you know, that, those kinds of questions. Yeah, I think it's okay to tell them. Um, if you happen to be going on a Four Seasons type vacation and you wouldn't want that getting out, 
Um, you know, it's a tricky question, right? But, I, you know, I think we ought to own our choices, and we ought to own our choices with our children. And if it makes us uncomfortable to spend that much, or if it would make us uncomfortable for people to find out, well, then don't post your Four Seasons photos on Instagram, that's for sure. Um, but, you know, then maybe we ought to check. Like, are we really spending money in a way that makes us feel good? Or um, would we be better off going camping and putting that money towards college or charity or um, you know, adding another room on the house so we could have bigger parties to make more memories with the people that we love, right? Um, so I think it's okay to tell them, and even better, it's uh, you can bring them in on it, right? You can say, all right, you know, this is the uh, this is the budget for vacation this year. You decide, and you know, we can downgrade the hotel and you know, upgrade the you know, day trips, or um, we can pack our own food and stay in the Four Seasons but not eat in the restaurant, right? I mean, you can, you can do all sorts of things and you never know what they might be willing to try. And, you know, I get, this, I get that the stakes are sort of high because we grown-ups don't have a lot of vacation time. So do we really want them planning all of our vacations? Maybe not, but it's a fun experiment to try at least once. <coughs> uh -huh. yeah, so does oh. your book cover anything about uh, university life? So the question is, does my book cover university life? Um, I made a decision to stop at roughly 16 or 17 because the whole question of who pays for college and how much and where has, is so complex and it's gotten so big that I actually believe uh, that it's the biggest financial decision that anyone will ever make. Uh, and, and the fact that um, teenagers are making that decision is madness. It's a real problem. Um, so I'll have more to say about that uh, at some point in the near future. But um, the one thing I do address is that because it is a really, really big uh, decision, um, and it's a really big number, um, the kids should have some skin in the game. And I profiled one family that sits down with each and every 14-year-old, and there have been four of them, and says, OK, you're going into high school now. You're probably going to want to go to college. And you are going to pay for the first semester of tuition. And that has added up to I think the last one paid fifteen or sixteen thousand dollars to go to Northwestern, um, and we're going to support you. We will wake up at five in the morning before you have your driver's license and take you to whatever job you want to get. Um, you know, we'll help you with your resume. We'll, you know, we'll help you with your taxes. But you are going to earn this money, and you don't have a choice in the matter. And they scrubbed toilets, and they scooped ice cream, and they umpired softball games, and when they were old enough, they worked as barbacks and got their lifeguard credentials, and they all did it, because it's just what they did. Um, and, you know, and the kids all, you know, Harvard, Northwestern, Stanford, right? I mean, it's, you know, look, these, this is correlation, right? But I, I think there's something to the fact that, you know, a work ethic and knowing what it means to work for somebody other than your family uh, who doesn't you know, doesn't give a lick about you and is not going to cut you any slack and will fire you if you show up at 5.31 in the morning instead of 5.30. You know, this is all good. I think it can make college easier uh, in some ways. Time. During high school time. I yeah, during the summers. It's too late. It's too late. Too late. It's too late to, to have that conversation. My oh, about, my, about college. Yeah, about paying for college. My daughter's yeah. nine with three jars. Yeah. One is funny money. One is college mm -hmm. savings. And the other, I forget. Uh -huh. so, Mm -hmm. We are talking about that now. When I went to college, yeah. my parents paid my tuition, and I paid everything else. And growing up, I knew from an early age that I was, was on responsible you. for that. Right. I had $15,000 saved up by the time I went to college, yeah. and that was a while ago. Right. So, like, so yeah, so you're I right. I was saving since I was in fourth grade uh -huh. planning for that. Yeah. And so when I got to high school, like, I worked three years in my high school job and stuff like that. And so that, that is, that's what you want to impress upon. Yeah. No, I totally understand. So your point about starting earlier with the college talk and the college tuition is, is um, totally right. Uh, this family that I was talking about before, they had saved enough and done well enough that they were going to be able to pay for everything else. So the kids, the first semester was on the kids, but everything else the parents were going to be able to handle. So that not, most families are not like that. And if your family is not like that, um, you know, you need to say so, or, or if you think you're not going to be like that, you need to tell them at the earliest possible age. We tell our daughter um, how much of college we've managed to 
put aside every six months when the statement comes. We say, Talia, we've gotten to, I, I don't even, I don't remember what the number is, but we say, you know, we've got 32% finished now. Um, and we think by next year we'll be at 36%. Uh, and then when you go to college, you know, you're going to work and we're going to work and we're going to, you know, not go on vacation for four years. Uh, and we're going to shovel even more money at it. And then, you know, maybe we'll have to pay some loans back afterwards. But, um, you know, this is a really, really large number now. And, you know, maybe we'll get some help and maybe you'll qualify for some financial aid, but maybe you won't. And, uh, you know, I think they, they need to be aware of it. I mean, look, what, what's happened um, very quietly in a way that nobody has noticed and I had not noticed until somebody actually, you know, sort of hit me over the head and, and told me a couple of weeks ago, they said, we've gone in America from a point where there were only two things in our lives that we paid for over decades, right? Our house, if you have a mortgage, and our retirement, which you save for over 40 years or whatever, to there being three things that we pay for over decades. We've now added college to that mix just a generation later, right? You spend 20 years saving for it, and then if you've got to borrow, whether you're yanking equity out of the house or taking a parent, a parent plus loan, or the kid is taking on debt, maybe they're consolidating it eventually into a, you know, a, another different kind of loan, you could be looking as a family at half a century to pay for this bill, which could easily be over a quarter of a million dollars in today's dollars per family. It's a lot of money, it's a big deal, and it is a real problem. Um, <laughs> stay tuned. Oh, so I, um, you and then you, okay. How, how do you bring in macroeconomic stuff? Your, your kids are saving, yeah. inflation's gonna go to 18%. <laughs> you money into 529 and some bozo politician proposes that. Right, yeah. I, you know, I don't go there all that much with kids, although, you know, when they ask about social class, right, it, you know, it's, it's hard not to um, have a, a larger discussion with them about, um, okay, well, how did, why is it that some people earn so much more than other people? And shouldn't we be doing something to make it more equal? You know, what, what, what's the government version of a share machine, and you know, the share machine question was answered by the kid in the next picture who, you know, uh, didn't want to pay the higher taxes. And so, I mean, this, they get it, right? So these, are, these were five-year-olds who drew those pictures, and what the macroeconomic reasons that I'm so passionate about this is, I mean, the college is just the start of it, right? Um, they are going to um, graduate into a world where more and more responsibility and risk has been heaped upon them at the age of 22. We are all essentially responsible for our own retirements now, although we might work for the New York Times or Microsoft where we get some stock or we get a match. But even so, we've got to put money in in order to get whatever we get. Uh, it, we are legally required to buy health insurance now, which is a pretty big deal, uh, particularly if you don't work for an employer that just hands you a form and asks you to check a box, right? So kids are going to have to do that. Um, and, you know, there are enough hiccups in the economy we've seen just in the last 20 years um, that it's clear now that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's essential to win your 20s, right? You've got all this responsibility. Uh, you can't wait to get your act together uh, until you're in your 30s or 40s because there just won't be enough time to save. I mean, you'll literally work uh, the entire rest of your life. So they have to be ready for that, and, and you know, and it doesn't end there. I mean, I don't want to depress you. These are not insurmountable <laughs> challenges, right? But, you know, I mean, you mentioned politicians, right? So, I mean, I think it's becoming increasingly clear to all of us that we um, have not taxed ourselves enough to pay for all of the promises that we have made to one another, whether it's municipal or state pensions, whether it's Medicare, you know, all the things that we would like to do, and in fact, promises that we have made, uh, we are now talking about breaking. And so it doesn't really matter where you are on the political spectrum. You may think that um, the best solution to this problem is to raise taxes some more, or you may think the best solution to the problem is to break the promises that we've made or certainly not make any new ones and slowly lower what the government provides, um, in which case people are reaching into their own pockets more. But either way, a couple of extra percentage points of income are going to be flying out of our kids' pockets and ours too. Uh, I think in the next 10 to 15 years so that we don't um, break these promises or to pay each of us for the cost of the fact that they're being broken. And so, I mean, this is not doomsday stuff, right? It just means that they have to be ready at the earliest possible age 
uh, to spend and save in the wisest possible manner. There's, he's just, you know, flitting around in your 20s now. I mean, it's not an economic death sentence, right? But it just puts you so far behind the eight ball that you're, I think it's almost um, indisputably the case that, you know, your life may not be uh, as good uh, as it would be as if you started earlier. And so that's the reason to have these conversations, uh, you know, for a decade or more before we shove them off to college or whatever they're going to do. So my question is around grandparents. Mm -hmm. um, my kids are five and seven, mm -hmm. very impressionable and whatnot. And several times they say, well, I'm just going to ask grandma then, uh -huh. kind of thing. And, you know, grandma's like, hey, that's what I'm here for. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm on this earth to spoil my grandkids. So, mm -hmm. like, what's your advisement there and how do you handle yeah. that? And, Yeah, how often are they hanging out with the grandparents? Well, they live here. They live here? Local, so. Uh huh. And is it, um, they're, they're literally calling them up every week and asking for things and then no, they get them? No, no, or? No. Okay. Just, uh, you know, it's not like a huge problem. Yeah. But, you know, they, they get it. They understand, well, right. if you say no, mom, I'm just going to ask grandma. Right? Yeah. I mean, so, they've already mm, said that. I mean, sure. It's not like it's this perpetual thing, but it could be. Right. Soon. Yep, yeah, so the question is, you know, what to do about grandparents and the grandparent menace. Um, so, yeah, I, I originally thought that I was going to write a whole chapter about this, but I, I was actually, um, I, I actually decided that I was wrong. Uh, and unless there is, um, you know, kind of a dire situation where they are both, um, you know, maybe living with you and or your primary source of after-school child care, and they are sort of deliberately subverting kind of foundational rules that you've set, um, then I think it's probably okay. I mean, unless you feel like they are kind of the first kids to get every new thing in every category and it's kind of out of control and they're becoming so used to the grandparents saying yes that they're becoming materialistic, that they're valuing stuff over people and relationships, then I'd probably let it go, right? Because um, you're their parents, they live with you, um, they're going to pick up your values uh, more than they're going to pick up their grandparents' values. And not only do we want them to love uh, the grandparents, we want them to want to go to the grandparents so that, you know, we can have a little time to ourselves. So I think unless it's completely out of hand, uh, you know, I won't try to nip it in bud. Yeah, and look, you know, every family has their own list of banned items, and I think there you draw the line. And, um, you know, for me it was that leather mini skirt, right? Um, you know, for you it may be, um, you know, guns or, or uh, whether, you know, a gun like, Je like Zeb had or, you know, fake guns. It may be um, pierced navels, it may be push-up bras, it may be dogs, right? I mean, if the, you know, if the grandparents show up with a puppy and they haven't asked you yet, um, you know, it could be end days for everybody, right? Um, so, you know, make it clear what's on your banned item list. Uh, you know, I, it hadn't occurred to me to put um, leather skirts on the banned <laughs> item list for three-year-olds. Um, but, but still, you know, you're in charge and, uh, you know, it all goes back if you don't like it. And uh, nobody else has to like it, but... You know, it's on you. <laughs> All right, one more here in the front. Um, this is a question regarding um, schools. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes we make, as parents, we make a choice to send them to private school and, mm -hmm. you know, cut back on other expenses. And, of course, they don't really, um, you know, the age of five and six, they don't really understand mm -hmm. the choices that you make. Mm -hmm. um, how do you approach that? I mean, is there any sure. that you've given that? Sure. Um, so I, uh, the question was, um, if you're choosing between private and public school, and let's say you make the choice for private school, how do you explain it? There's two stories about that. Um, uh, one I heard uh, just a couple of weeks ago um, from a parent who told me that she sits down with her five-year-old and her seven-year-old every month, and they sit down in front of the, um, you know, the computer, and they dial up the website for the school, and she has the kids push the button on the mouse to move the money from the checking account to the school so that they know. And then I heard a story from a Brooklyn family a couple years ago who told me that their daughter, who was 10 years old, had discovered the bill for the private school. And she said, I didn't know you were paying for this. So the parents clearly, were they embarrassed by it? Uh, did they not want her asking uncomfortable questions about why you, you know, pay for our school when there's a perfectly good public school nearby? Um, you know, because then we start getting into the whole question of why do families make different choices? 
Uh, and that can be an uncomfortable question to ask without you know, devaluing uh, the schools in your community or um, without uh, kind of um, uh, inadvertently or, or indirectly uh, criticizing the choices of other parents or other parents who may not be able to make that choice because they can't write the checks or they can't qualify for financial aid for whatever reason or because they didn't want to make the sacrifices that you have made. And so you, know, you try not to um, criticize other people's decision making or other people's schools. And you can just say something like this. You know, this was the choice that was best for us and it was best for you. Um, and we like what this school stands for because you know, we like the values that you're learning and we like the fact that you have these musical instruments or that you, um, you know, have two teachers in your classroom instead of one. Uh, that doesn't make it better than any other school uh, in general. It just makes it better for you. Um, and we sacrifice to do this. And it's almost always a sacrifice because, you know, if you're writing a thirty or $35,000 check, that could certainly go to charity, right, <laughs> if it wasn't going to uh, private school tuition. So there is a sacrifice being made. You're being less generous or you have a smaller house or you take fewer vacations. Um, but, you know, you say this was a choice that we made because we felt like this was the way to spend the money that would um, give us the most happiness because you would have a really happy experience in school and we really want you to be happy. Uh, and so that's why we did what we did. Um, but that doesn't mean that your friends, uh, you know, made a wrong choice. They just made a different one or one that was right for them. How's that sound? Good. But I have, you know, uh, what I wanted was also in terms of, you know, they go into school and they see a different spending. Oh, okay. So it's the compare. You're asking about the comparison stuff too. Yeah, I mean, look, that's that's hard, particularly in communities where there are people with a lot of money, and you know, again, this is one of the situations where they don't have to like the answer, and we may feel defensive about it too, because what they're saying is, you know, I mean, around here, the, the version of that question is, why didn't you start a company instead of just working for one? <laughs> Right? I mean, a bratty 13 or 14 year old might stick you with that, right? And, you know, and it feels like an indictment of the choice that you've made or of your own enterprise or, or you know, sort of smarts, right? So, you know, you got to take a deep breath. Um, you know, again, it's perfectly reasonable for them to ask these questions. Uh, and then you just try and explain to them, look, you know, there are not very many people in the world who can do all of those amazing things um, that, you know, you seem to want to do yourself. Um, you know, we, we are not one of them uh, right now. Um, you have the ability to go out and earn more and become one. Um, but uh, hopefully if you're doing the gratitude rituals all along, they have a sense not only of what they do have, but also the special things that make your family unique. And you want to emphasize those, whether it's a, you know, st uh, a hard scrabble, you know, immigrant tale, a, um, you know, surviving, uh, you know, a, a noxious man with a mustache who wanted to wipe your people off the planet, right? Um, you know, we all have these stories or we all have our own existing rituals um, that make us unique, the way that we give together or the places that we go, the things that we do, you know, all those things directly or indirectly uh, involve money. And so, you know, you have your own unique way of being in the world and you try when they're, you know, feeling a little bit less or lesser uh, to remind them that there's some things that are really awesome about your family too. So um, I think that's it. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'll hang around, answer questions, sign books. And um, oh, one other thing I should tell you, uh, I've done a partnership with Donors Choose as part of this book launch. Uh, it's a nonprofit that some of you may know that allows you to direct your giving uh, to teachers who post projects online uh, for which they want funding for their public school classrooms. It's a particularly great way for kids to give because they get to see exactly where the money is going. You can literally go on and say, I like, you can say tie-dye. You know, if, uh, my daughter loved tie-dye a couple of years ago. We found three tie-dye projects all over the country. We dropped some money in one of the buckets and two months later we got uh, this envelope in the mail with, you know, 22 thank you notes and all these pictures of kids in their tie-dye shirts that my daughter had helped pay for. So anyway, um, with each book that you buy, you get a $27 Donors Choose gift card to use with your kids or buy yourself if you don't want to share it uh, online. And um, thanks for being here.